we, the organizing team, regret the sudden postponement of the lecture scheduled on the 30th of October due to some unavoidable circumstances and apologize for the inconvenience thus caused. But with an untethered spirit, we have come with today's lecture and it's an honor to have with us as a speaker, Mr. Kuldeep Patwari, Assistant Professor, Department of History, Guwahati University, Assam. And he will be speaking on a very interesting theme, gastronomic proportions, food in the shaping of history. Welcome, Kuldeepda. We have with us Principal of Morigao College and Patron of the HSM Lecture Series, Dr. Lila Kantabor Thakur, the coordinator of the HSM Lecture Series and the HOD of the Department of History, Mr. Deepak Kalita. Uh, we have with us the family members, the alumni, the students, non-teaching staff, faculty members, and, and the members of the HSM Lecture Series of Morigao College who have joined us today. Welcoming all for another productive endeavor through this lecture, I now request our principal, sir, Dr. Lila Kantabor Thakur, to deliver the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Shuman. A very good evening to everyone. Uh, respected uh, resource person, Mr. Kuldeep Patwari, Assistant Professor, Department of uh, History, Guwahati University. My respected colleague present here, head of the Department of uh, History, Deepak Kolita, and the other faculty members of the department, Dr. Sarada Sri Soduri, and my dear students. The Department of History is going to organize this hard lecture program a uh, Himangshu Sharma Memorial Lecture, and uh, I am very happy that uh, the department uh, has been organizing such type of uh, memorial lecture. And uh, we all know that uh, Dr. Himangshu Sharma was a very uh, energetic professor in the Department of uh, History, and uh, he was involved uh, in different uh, activities of our college. Even I once uh, offered him uh, IQAC coordinator, but he, some uh, reasons, he refused to uh, take this responsibility, but he had uh, such type of quality, and I offered uh, such type of uh, responsibility. And uh, I pay my homage to the departed uh, soul of uh, Dr. Himangsu Sarma. And uh, we are uh, uh, still uh, remembering, commemorate uh, him in this uh, event. I hope that uh, this uh, lecture series will be a very, very, very benefited to all the participants, especially for the students. And uh, the topic, gastronomic property uh, proportions, in the shaping of history. I think that this is a very interesting topic. I don't have such type of uh, any, any uh, specific knowledge on the topic, but still we have some uh, uh, ideas. So, um, for example, we put the sugar in tea, but some country they do not put the sugar in tea. So this uh, must have some significant uh, historical uh, background. And uh, I hope that uh, such type of uh, topic, uh, uh, we will all benefit from this uh, discussion. And uh, with uh, these few words, I formally inaugurate this lecture series. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for your kind and inspiring words, always. We will now proceed to the next activity. Uh, it is Dr. Himang Shu Sharma, as we know him. And this will be delivered by Pradeep Soitya, sir, Assistant Professor, Department of Mathematics, and a member of the Himang Shu Sharma Memorial Lecture Series group. I request, uh, sir, to deliver the lecture. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Suman, for giving me this opportunity. Actually, I want to speak a little about Himangshu Sharma, sir, in Assam is because words will be not enough for me to express my feelings towards him. 
So I will choose Assamese language for delivering my lectures. Himanshu Sharma sir, our Bihar, Kobole Kuwato era bhoot khobhay kor kotha. Aro ki kom, keto wordot khamuri rakha tu era bol dagor kotha. Kot ketiya lok paishilo manusonok khe kotha tu mo khub khothik thabe manot kala bolu dikdar zadiu. Teno logot ziman kine khoma otikrom kori shu. ये खोमाए कि नहीं, एको एको टा क्यों मूल कारण है जटस्तो गुरुत्व पुन्नो आरु तार पर कि किसू बहुत कि नहीं कोटा, ये मौज के टमन को बिखोए जरी कोबोले जाओ, प्रथम कोटा ऐसों खिखो किसा पे क्यों क्या नहीं कुआ, तो ये धारणा तो जरी मौज लोबोले जाओ, मूल मनोता से तेतिया मैथमेटिक्स डिपार्टमेंट आरु हिस्ट्री आरु क्योंकि निखो मत एडिन अकॉन हिस्ट्री पेपर होत ऐता ऑनकोर भी खोयत की बा उलाल तो ट्रिब ऐता बीतोर पोरी धीर भी खोए पाय ओनुपत्तूर भी खोए कालीर भी खोए पाइथा गुरा सर खुट्टोर भी खोए ऑल ऑफ किसी बस्तु आसे ते ओ क्लास और पहाय था का बस्ता ते मू उसोलो है इसे क्लास स्टूडेंट की � जैसे प्रोडी पलों पर हासुन आही पलाय मुक किसू बस्तु वालों बिफारी बोला है मैं भावना है तो भविष्य की बारा बस्तुओं को था कन्यों के तेवर तेवर हेमिलिया हो है इन्हें वो कोई गोइसू गोइ मुक क्लास तो खुमुआई दिस है खुमुआई दी कोई से जब आदि मोयू सत्तो तुम्हार आरु ए सत्तो सत्ती होकलों तुम्हें उपकृ ये अनुपात बिलकुल बिखरे मुख कुनो धोने नॉलेज ने और सत्तो सत्ती बिलकुल सिनाई कोई दिस है जब एजन बोनी तो हंगाटिक धोनो किक्को जब खेरे तुम्हारे लोग जिकने बुझा बो खेकने मुख कुनो पौधे कुनो किकियो बुझा बो नॉल आरु मानो हो मुख्य आगत पकोंगा कोरा तक खेरे तो होते सके ऊपर कुनो एजन दिल्ली � तुम्ही जिमान पौड़ी पक्को भावे तेरे लोगों को खिखारो प्रदान करी बा के बस्ते तो खेत्र भाई तो सके मौर कोरोबात नहो कोरोबात अपारोग हों जिए तुम वह गोनीटो प्रकीटो ऐसा सत्रों नहो हैं गोटी के तार पर अनुधावन कोई वो पर ये तो कोठा जब ते खेते सत्रों सत्री खिकाबोर कारणों अल्टीमेटली प्रॉपर सोर्सेस दूसरी ओर कथा तो ते कहते हो कि दिल्ली में साबुले जाओ ते कहते हो लीडरशिप क्वालिटी तो लीडरशिप क्वालिटी तो खंगाटिक भावे अरण निपुण कैरेक्टरिस्टिक्स गोनीटो सत्र हो तो मौए किंतु मुट्के वैसी गोनीटो हो तो सुखा जीवन और कहते हो जीवन और गोनीटो ते कहते हैं सिले ते कहते हो दूसरा काम और कहते हो केके यूनिटर सेक्रेटरी ऐसे ले, सो यूनिटर सेक्रेटरी जितने बाप ते के ते हैंडोफार कोरी बोले गया ऐसे, तारु ऑडिटर मौय ऐसे ले, अब मौय देखी सिलो, ऐसा डूब गोई था का ऑडिट, यूनिटर सेक्रेटरी को था मौय को, जितने दशस्त धार आही सिले, अरु के तो सार्प्लस वाले ते के ते नीडी सिले, अरु के ऑडिट तू कोरी सिल खूब खुन्दर हो बे कोड़ी चले। इतिहास हो आने तक कोठा ले। हिमांग सुसर मासर। जब तेरो लोगों को मौह प्राय किस्मान को साथ आहो आलोचनात। अरु के तारे भी तोड़ ऐताव इन्नोटो मालूचना आसीले। जब मानुहो जीवन तो दुनिया। होठात जरिया मैं हराय जाऊँ। अमक कुने मनोट रखीले। के बिखोए तो मूर मनोटो फराय � आरु हिमांशु सोमा सरे कोई सिले मुक जे प्रोडीप के सिंधा तो मुरु न था कानो है मौस सारो को जे सार कैलो जे दिया मी हराय जाऊं अमक कुने मनोट रखी हुई ठीक है मुख पर सिंधा तो हो जाए नेक वाला काम पूरी बोले जे जाते अमक मन है मनोट रखो हिमांशु सोमा सरे के बोस्ते तो कोई सिले सारो लोगों को मौस खेखोर प मौसी है ऐसी है सबे ऐसी लोग खेतों पर इकत्त सारे मौस अमी अकेलो के पर इकत्त चलाए सिले सारे मुक जुर कोई सिले के पर इकत्त तो क्या खोट जे अमी ये ता काम करो अमी ये ता आलमिरा दियो ये ता पर इकत्त कमिटी के ता आलमिरा दियो आरु के आलमिरा तो मुक खूब जुर कोई सिले पुरी तुम्ही नाम तो लिखवा व्यवस्था 
আমার এই আলমিরাটো দেখিলেতো কেতিয়াবা মানুহৰ মনত পৰিব আমাৰ আৰু তেতিয়া আমাৰ কথা আহিব আৰু মো লাগিছিল স্যার ইমান কিয় জুৰ কৰিছে প্ৰথম দিনাখন আহা নাছিল নামটো ভাল হোৱা নাছিল ৰং হোৱা নাছিল আকৌ মোক মানুহ পঠাই নাই তুমি ভালকে লিখোৱা নাম কিটা কি বস্তু কিটা স্যার বৰ বেছি গুৰুত্ব দিছিল এতিয়া কেতিয়াবা কেতিয়াবা আমাৰ অনুভৱ হয় যে হয়তো স্যারকে স্যারে কিবা জানিছিল নে কি হৈছিল একো আমি অনুধাবন কৰিব নোৱাৰিলো এখিনি সময় কিন্তু এতিয়া কেতিয়াবা সেই গড্ৰেজটো চাই পেলাই যেতিয়া নামটো দেখা পাওঁ সেইটো নামটো দেখা পালে অনুভৱ হয় আৰু এতিয়া লাগে যে সেই আলোচনাবিলাকৰ অৰ্থ স্যারে অনুধাবন কৰিছিল আৰু এতিয়া স্যারক এতিয়াও আমি জীয়াই ৰাখিবলৈ সক্ষম হৈ আছোঁ আৰু স্যাৰ আমাৰ মাজত সদায় এই ধৰণে জীয়াই আছে নেক্সট কথাটো হ'ল মানুহে সেইজন মানুহৰ বেছি গুণ গায় যোনজন মানুহে তেওঁৰ জীৱনত কিবা নহয় কিবাভাৱে উপকৃত কৰিছে মই তেনেকৈ ভাবোঁ এতিয়া কথাটো হৈছে তেনেকুৱা যে মোক উপক মই স্যাৰৰ পৰা উপকৃত হৈছোঁ বাবে স্যাৰৰ গুণ গাই আছোঁ তেনেকুৱা কোনো কথা নহয় মই দেখি আছোঁ মোৰ ওচৰে পাজৰ সমাজখনতো এনেকুৱা বহুত মানুহ মোৰ মুখৰ আগতো মই দেখিছোঁ কিছুমান মানুহক স্যাৰক মই চিনিও নাপাওঁ স্যাৰেও হয়তো চাগে ভালকে চিনি নাপায় তেনেকুৱা মানুহ মোৰ মুখৰ আগত মই স্যাৰৰ জৰিয়তে উপকৃত হোৱা দেখিছোঁ আৰু প্ৰত্যেকে দেখি আছে যে কে কে হেণ্ডিকৰ এটা সময় যেতিয়া স্যাৰে লিডাৰশ্বিপত আছিলে যে কে কে হেণ্ডিকৰ কিমান উত্তৰ উত্তৰণ ঘটিছিলে আৰু সেইখিনি সময়ত অনস্বীকাৰ্যভাৱে যে স্যাৰৰ কৰ্তৃত্ব আছিলে সেইটো আমি সবেই স্বীকাৰ্য মানে মানি ল'বই লাগিব এতিয়া কথা হৈছে স্যাৰৰ অভাৱ প্ৰতি মুহূৰ্ততে অনুভৱ কৰা যাব স্যাৰৰ পৰা শিকিবলগীয়া বহুত কথাই আছে যিবোৰ যদি আমি এই ধৰণৰ লেকচাৰ চিৰিজটো সেইকাৰণে মই গুৰুত্ব প্ৰদান কৰিম যে ইয়াৰ পৰা কিছুমান সৰু সৰু কথা আমি শিকিব লাগে স্যাৰৰ এটা কথা মোৰ সদায় মনত আছিলে যে আমি যেতিয়াই যাওঁ কলেজলৈ মই এতিয়াও সেই বস্তুটো অনুভৱ কৰোঁ যে ক'ৰবাত নহয় ক'ৰবাত কলেজত এই বস্তুটো হেৰাই গৈছিলে যে স্যাৰে সদায় গৈ পাওঁতে যিমানে কিবা চিন্তাতে নাথাকক কিবাই নাথাকক গৈ পাওঁতে আৰম্ভণিতে মোক যেতিয়া দেখা পায় প্ৰদীপ ক'ৰ পৰা আহিলা ক্লাছো কৰা নেকি তুমি এই ধৰণৰ কিছুমান সৰু খুহুতীয়া কথাই দিনটো ইমান সুন্দৰভাৱে আৰম্ভণি হৈ যায় আৰু ছাৰৰ পৰা মই এটা বস্তু শিকিছিলোঁ যে মানুহ যিমানে কুৎসিত নহওক কিয় আটাইতকৈ বেছি সৌন্দৰ্যতাটো ড্ৰেছ পাতিত নহয় আটাইতকৈ বেছি সৌন্দৰ্যতাটো লুকাই থাকে মানুহৰ মুখৰ হাঁহিটো আৰু ছাৰৰ সেই হাঁহিটোৱে ছাৰক অতিপাত সৌন্দৰ্য শীল ব্যক্তি কৰি তুলিছিলে আৰু প্ৰত্যেক ক্ষেত্ৰতে ছাৰৰ ওপৰত যদি কাৰোবাৰ খঙো উঠিছে বা কিবাও উঠিছে ছাৰৰ সেই হাঁহিটোৰ জৰিয়তে ছাৰে সেই খংটো একেবাৰে ক্ষান্ত কৰিবলৈ সক্ষম হৈছিল গতি এনেকুৱা বহুতো গুণ আছে যিবোৰ গুণৰ যদি অলপমান গুণো এজন মানুহৰ ওচৰত থাকে সেই মানুহজন যে অমৰ হ'ব পাৰিব তাত নিসন্দেহ সেয়া ক'ব পাৰি গতিকে ছাৰৰ পৰা অমৰত্ব হোৱাৰ যথেষ্ট জ্ঞান পোৱা গৈছে আৰু সেই জ্ঞানবিলাক যদি মানুহে অলপ অলপকে আহৰণ কৰে মই ভাবোঁ মানুহৰ জীৱনটো সফল হ'ব আৰু ক'বলগীয়া বহুতেই আছে কিন্তু সময় সীমিত কেতিয়াবা যদি আকৌ কোৱাৰ সুযোগ পাওঁ নিশ্চয় আকৌ আৰু নিজৰ অভিজ্ঞতা ক'বলৈ যত্ন কৰিম ধন্যবাদ থেংক ইউ ছ' মাছ স্যার আমি আপুনি বহুত সন্ধিয়া ধুনীয়াকে আমাৰ মাজত ইউ জাষ্ট ৰিভাইভ আগেন হোৱাট হিমাংশু স্যাৰ ৱাজ আৱাৰ ইজ ৰেডাৰ থেংক ইউ ছ' মাছ আগেন ফৰ ইয়ৰ ৱাৰ্ম ৱৰ্ডছ এবাউট হিম উই উইল নাও প্ৰচিড টু দি নেক্সট এক্টিভিটি উই হেভ উইথ আজ মিষ্টাৰ ৰাজ পল্লভ নাথ হি ইজ এন এছিষ্টেণ্ট প্ৰফেচৰ ইন ডিপাৰ্টমেণ্ট অফ হিষ্ট্ৰী এণ্ড মেম্বাৰ অফ দি হিমাংশু শৰ্মা মেমৰিয়েল লেকচাৰ চিৰিজ আই ৰিকুৱেষ্ট হিম টু Proceed to the next activity by introducing uh, to the resource person. I request her to take over. Thank you, Suman. Good evening to one and all. Respected principal, sir. Respected HOD, Deepak Kalida, sir. And all my colleagues and my dear students and all the esteemed participants of today's lecture series. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce to you all today's speaker and who is also a very good friend of mine mr kuldeep patwari so kuldeep patwari teaches history at the department of history guwahati university and he had earlier taught at jemtc school of law greater noida and also at northeastern hills university uh, tura campus his research interests are in the field of medieval and uh, early modern south asia environmental ecological history history of non human species connected histories and geographies thank you over to you suman thank you raj for the warm introduction thank you raj sir for your introduction of the resource person we will now proceed to the next activity that is the beginning of the technical session i welcome kulipda once again to this uh, platform today uh, kulipda over to you you can now begin with the technical session 
and welcome again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Suman. Uh, I must a uh, couple of things before before uh, I begin today's lecture. First of all, I can't express how happy I am that I have been given this platform again. Uh, uh, previously, also uh, I had had the opportunity or the good fortune of speaking in front of the esteemed audience of Morikang College, and uh, this time again, and particularly for an August uh, um, exercise like the Himang Sorma Memorial Lecture, uh, I'm really happy that I have been given the honor to to speak to uh, the participants today. And uh, secondly, uh, I would like to apologize for the postponement of the event that had to take place. Unfortunately, my uh, supervisor, Professor Rajatata, and a retired professor of uh, Center for Historical Studies, JNU, passed away a couple of days back. Uh, that is on the 30th of October. Uh, he was suffering from cancer for a couple of months. And uh, his passing away was quite sudden in a way. And that left a uh, big mark on many of us, his research scholars, his colleagues, and his students. So uh, that way, it was a bit difficult for me to speak on uh, uh, that day. And hence, I had requested the organizers to postpone the lecture. And I'm really thankful that you accommodated my request. And I'm thankful to the authorities and the organizing committee for, for this uh, adjustment of the schedule. Uh, Having said that, I'd like to move ahead with uh, today's lecture. Uh, at the onset, I'd like to say that uh, today's lecture is uh, is more aimed. Uh, I had actually asked Raj that who are going to be the primary audience for the lecture under Himang Sorma Memorial Lecture Series. And he had told me that it would usually be largely constituted of students. So um, keeping that in mind, I thought that uh, rather than you know, bank upon something uh, research oriented or something from my own uh, work experience, what I thought that, you know, I should pick up a theme uh, related to history that might spark interest in our students for, you know, carrying out further research, carrying out further studies in history. And uh, with that in mind, uh, what, uh, what I, uh, like, there were various themes that were going around in my mind and uh, very, <laughs> Like the serendipity of it was like uh, I like I was eating sausages that I had got from Goa at that point of time, and uh, when when I was in Goa and when when I was buying those sausages, uh, I was uh, you know I was fortunate enough to learn the uh, you know background the history of how those sausages ended up being uh, made in Goa. What was the influence of that? And, uh, and how do we know those sausages today? And it so turns out that it has a very rich, uh, you know, rather European history as its background. And so while I was eating that, I was like, okay, this is something that, you know, I can pick up on. This is something that, you know, will let me speak to the students and talk to them in terms of things that are very close to our heart, uh, rather things that are, you know, very essential for our existence rather. Right. So, uh, you know, if if living your life is important, then I think eating food would be as important as that because you can't really be alive if you're not eating. So and and, and the food we eat, uh, the the kind of uh, cuisine we have, uh, the kind of uh, different uh, you know items that we have in our diet, uh, uh, in a way shapes our culture, uh, shapes our history, and you know also shapes us as communities. So with that, uh, I'd like to uh, begin today's presentation. I'll be sharing a uh, you know, very small basic PowerPoint that I have prepared. I don't really enjoy too much of words in my PowerPoint presentations. So I'll be speaking at length, but I'll also be uh, you know, using a PowerPoint and uh, for, for the benefit of the students so that they can follow what I'm talking about. And if at any time, you know, the internet creates issues that I might switch off the video and continue with the PowerPoint. Let me just quickly share it.
I hope the uh, PowerPoint is visible. Yes, yes, it is visible. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so, without further ado, let's let's move ahead with our today's talk. Uh, so, the title of today's talk is "Gastronomic Proportions: Food in the Shaping of History." Um, the jalebi has a significance, definitely. Uh, there are two significances uh, of the picture of the jalebi that I, jilapi or jalebi that I put up in the cover picture. Uh, first of all, it's the puja season, and you know, for us, puja has now become ubiquitous with you know jalebis and different kinds of street food that we consume more than the more than what's inside the pandals itself. It's what's outside the pandals, the kind of mela that goes around, the kind of food we get to eat, uh, the kind of stuff that we get to buy in and around puja pandals that become you know more interesting for us and have been interesting for us since we were kids. So uh, one jalebi is the flavor of the season. Um, my long association with North India, where winters were signified by, you know, hot jalebis and hot halwa, you know, have kind of left a mark uh, as far as that is concerned. And secondly, because jalebi also has a very interesting connection and how it, you know, ends up being a part of our cuisine, how it ends up being a part of our, uh, you know, community, uh, culture, religion. In fact, religious practices, not religion per se, but religious practices per se. Right. So that way, the picture of Jalebi has these two significance. I'll come for. The, I'll, I'll I'll explain the second one later on. Um, so food, uh, as I was saying, uh, food actually has had one of the uh, biggest uh, uh, influences on human history, and uh, the kind of cultures that developed throughout the world in Asia, in Africa in North South America, in Australia, the kind of communities that came up, the kind of human habitations that came up, the, the kind of you know population structure that grew uh, was in a way um, largely influenced and shaped by food. Of course, the other very important influence being the geography or the climate of the, uh, of the area as well. The other being the kind of food that was available. Again, of course, climate and geography would have a big impact on what kind of food was available. But at times, that that aspect was also taken care of by trade that used to occur between different communities, dif different countries, different habitations. So even if a particular geographical condition, even if a particular geographical location did not have a certain kind of food, then uh, it could be available in that area through trade. So that way, apart from geography, apart from climatic conditions, food has had a very big role to play in how our communities have been shaped, how our human history rather has come up. Right? Uh, most of us who have been students of history and even those who have not been students of history, we know that you know, it, it, modern studies, modern anthropological, archaeological studies have shown how uh, human history has progressed, how different uh, species and subspecies of human beings, starting from uh, Australopithecus to Homo habilis to Homo erectus to Homo sapiens and to the modern day Homo sapiens sapiens have evolved and how, you know, uh, from a hunter gatherer society, we as a civilization, when I say we, I, I mean the human civilization as a whole uh, on planet Earth. We as a civilization have moved from being a hunting gathering society to a uh, settled agricultural society. Most of our histories are of that nature, like how our ancestors, uh, you know, uh, two million years ago, up to two lakh years ago, were in a way largely and hunter gatherers, how they would hunt for food, how they would roam around different areas and gather different kinds of food, and how that hunted food and collected food would be brought back, and how that food would be eventually shared with the community, with the other people, with women, with older people, with children, and so on and so forth. Uh, students of ancient Indian history would be very familiar uh, as to how. Uh, the Rig Vedic society itself is supposed to have evolved, right? So those of us who have 
read uh, Rigvedic Society, or those of you who are going to read Rigvedic Society, you will read about how the earliest political structures emerged in the in 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 in, in the Ganga Yamuna uh, river basin, and particularly in the North Indian context, and how the Rigvedic Society is supposed to have started out, uh, you know, as a nomadic group that went on to you know uh, become agriculturalists they settled down and how for them wealth was usually calculated in terms of cattle and these are nothing but different ways in which food had you know left its stamp on human history on 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 the rigvedic society itself it's it's the kind of food that they ate it's the kind of agriculture that they carried out which dictated that cattle would become so important for them, right? Cows would become so important for them. And the cows have been so important that it's they are even important till date, right? Till till the 21st century, whether in politics, whether in food, whether in you know socio-cultural dynamics, cows have still remained relevant. And cows were relevant even 3,000 years ago when uh, you know the Rig Vedic society was going through its own transition. Where, where where you have the kind of political structure that was in emerging right so uh, we all know how the some of the first chiefs the rajans you know you used to take tribute in the form of cattle in the form of cows right so this is one of the earliest instances of how we can talk about at least in the indian context how food has you know left its indelible mark on the shaping of history itself Going back to the Goa story, right? So, uh, um, is, is, is the new photo visible? Has it loaded on everyone's screen? I hope it has loaded. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Right. So, uh, the photo, uh, you know, the long lines of sausages that kind of look like Rudraksha malas, these are basically the Goan traditional, traditional within quotes traditional Goan pork sausages, right? So uh, pork, uh, the pork meat is usually minced, mixed with different kinds of spices, then mixed with, uh, you know, uh, a traditional local Goan alcoholic drink called feni, which is either made from coconut or from cashew, kaju badam. And then uh, the meat is mixed, marinated, and then put inside casings. Uh, these casings are, you know, tied with strings at small intervals so that they end up looking like balls, right? If the person who was narrating the story to me uh, told me that these were the usual sizes of the Goan pork sausages where they look like balls, right? Rudraksha Mala type, you know, they look like that. But, you know, there are also some sausages where the size of, size of the sausages are bigger. And he was narrating that, you know, the unspoken culture was that you know if you have a very close friend or a very uh, or, or a relative or someone that you like very much has come to your home then you usually bring out the larger sized pork sausages and if it's someone who is, who is just a friend or an acquaintance or you just generally need to cook for yourself you would be bringing out these smaller ball sized you know sausages for consumption now uh, these are you know minced put inside casing and uh, tied with thread at regular intervals and then they are you know uh, allowed to dry in the sun and also smoked in the sun for two to three days at times even four days and then they are you know uh, sold in the markets by uh, the markets that i saw the couple of markets that i saw usually had women uh, selling them there were also a few men who sold these sausages but primarily women were selling these sausages and um, you know, it's a big time delicacy in Goa and uh, the sausages are, you know, uh, are very much there even in their breakfast. Uh, so, you know, frying the sausages with potato and uh, tomato and being ate with, eaten with bread, which they call pao or, you know, poi is something which is very traditional in Goan cultural life. Uh, what is interesting is that this was not the case 500 years back, right? So 500 years back, you do not really uh, find evidences of such pork sausages being uh, available in Goa or also being, you know, culturally consumed by the Konkani community that uh, lived in and around Goa. So what had happened 500 years back 
that you know uh, shaped this cultural phenomenon which has persisted with the goans for the last 500 years right which is something which is very ubiquitous in their cultural life in their cuisine and you know if you go to, go on to google and read different you know blog spots you will find long lists of blogs that tell how they miss this authentic goan pop sausages when they are abroad or when they are in other parts of india similar to how you know uh, you know i or my friends who were in delhi uh, studying in delhi we used to miss the kazi nemu that we used to find in assam which was not really available in delhi in delhi you really find this small round gul nemus uh, which were good which were tangy but they did not really have the flavor that the kazi nemu or the kazi tenga had that that we had grown up uh, consuming and so we always used to miss kazi kazi nemu and uh, you know whenever someone would be going from assam to delhi we would make it a point to tell them to you know bring kazi nemu close second would be bamboo shoot the bangas will be able to so you know these are things that you know that you become accustomed so uh, that you become so closely linked uh, through your upbringing through your heritage through your culture that you know even when you are not uh, you know consuming them you are made to miss them and these sausages for the goans for the konkani people of goa are such a nostalgia but then again as i said 500 years back you do not really see an evidence of this happening so what happened 500 years back so 500 years back what had happened was the portuguese had come to india right so we all know about uh, it's not the first time that the portuguese had come to india but it was the first time that the portuguese had ended up in 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 india so you know in 1498 you have Vasco da Gama landing up at the port of Calicut, and as they say, rest is history, right? So uh, you you uh, you have uh, a completely new trade route opening up. You have a new link opening up, and with that, you know, uh, a lot of changes also came about. Now, uh, Portuguese chorizo, the term chorizo that you see here. Chorizo in Portuguese basically means sausages, right? So the sausages that we talk about when we when we talk about sausages, we usually think about those long meat filled uh, substances that look smooth. But uh, traditionally, sausages have not been uh, as smooth as the processed sausages that we see today. And definitely, the Portuguese sausages, which they call chorizo, uh, were not you know as smooth as the sausages that we find in the markets today. Now, what had happened was uh, the Portuguese, uh, they used to make those sausages, uh, they used to make those sausages using wine and garlic, right? So, you know, they would, uh, you know, mince the meat, they would add wine and they would add garlic and then they would, you know, mash it all together, they would marinate it all together and then put it into casings and then preserve it in the form of sausages, either by drying it or by smoking it or by doing a combination of both both the smoking and the drying right uh, what the goans did with this chorizo was that instead of wine they ended up using fenny and along with garlic which the portuguese used in a large quantity uh, they added a lot of other spices that were locally found in india right so you have a lot of different spices being added to the to the to the to the sausage to the sausage meat to the minced meat and along with that uh, this is a term which most of us is familiar today peri peri so it's a kind of chili that the portuguese were able to find in south america that they carried with them to europe and from europe then they spread it to the rest of the world so what the what the konkani people in goa did was that instead of wine they used fenny and along with garlic, they added a whole lot of other spices along with the peri peri, the chili. And what you eventually have as an end result of that are the goan pork sausages. Now, it becomes very difficult to imagine how big of an impact these sausages had, but you can imagine from the statement that these sausages were in a way directly responsible for 
the direct sea route that the Portuguese were able to find to India. Now, I'll give you a bit of a context for that. Um, uh, has our world map loaded? Um, please tell me if it has loaded. Yes, yes, it has. Yes, it is. Right. And also, when I'm using the uh, stylus, when I'm writing, is it is the writing visible on the screen? Yes, it is. OK. Right. So if you look at the world map, so Portugal is here. Right. So on the left part, this is Portugal. And we have Spain towards its right. Now, for the most part, trade that used to happen between Asia and Europe used to happen through the land-based uh, trade routes, primarily the land-based uh, Silk Route that we talk about that goes from China all the way up to Europe, right? So from China, you have different branches of the Maritime Silk Route going to Europe. Right? And some branches of that used to come to India also. So you had like two, three branches that used to come through Northeast India. Then you had one branch that used to come from the Northwestern part of India. Right. And for, for, for the large part, for the largest part of human history, uh, trade between uh, Europe and Asia used to be taken care of by these land-based uh, trade routes. Now, uh, in the 14th, 15th century, what we primarily see is that the ruling polities in Europe, the ruling polities in Europe have, uh, you know, end up with a political conflict with the Ottoman Empire. Right. So if we talk about the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire would be somewhere here. And the ruling polities of Europe, if we talk about the ruling polities of Europe, we would be talking about England and Russia and Spain and Portugal and France and the Nordic countries, also Netherlands included. Right? So because of the political conflict that the Europeans were having with, uh, with the Ottoman Empire, what became very important for them was to bypass the Arab merchants that used to take care of trade between Europe and India. Now, these Arab merchants, their sphere of influence were was in the Persian Gulf. This was basically the Mediterranean Sea, then the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea. So this part, this part was where the Arab merchants used to have their monopoly. And of course, over the land part over here too, right? So uh, trade was uh, trade with India that Europe had was primarily in the hands of the Arab merchants. And because of the political conflict that the Europeans were having with the Ottomans and the larger ideological conflict that Christianity had with Islam led to a renewed vigor amongst the European states to find a direct sea route to India and Asia at large. Because they knew that, uh, you know, geographically speaking, if they go via land, they had to go through the Ottoman Empire. So finding a direct uh, land route was not really feasible for them because no matter where they go from, they would have to cross Arab lands, right? They would have to cross Ottomans. They would have to cross the other Arab lands. But contrary to that, if they're able to find a sea route, then they do not really have to go through the Arabs. They do not really have to uh, deal with the Arabs. Now, this also coincided with uh, the period, the 14th, 15th century period that we know of, the period post feudalism, post Black Death Europe, where we have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, revival taking place. Uh, the entire period as such is known as the Renaissance period. I mean, Renaissance period. So, Renaissance period in itself saw a lot of trade being carried out. It saw a lot of flourish, uh, flourishing in terms of art and culture. So, um, so basically uh, this uh, this explorations that the europeans were carrying out also coincided with a revival or or rather a growth in trade and commerce and and and, and because of that revival in trade and commerce what uh, the europeans had plenty of was uh, wealth resources in terms of money that they could invest 
in shipping expeditions. So, you know, 15th, 16th century is also uh, usually generally termed as the age of explorations and age of discoveries by the Europeans. That's because, uh, because of the uh, because, because of the number of explorations that they were carrying out, whether shipping, whether overland, you know, either in Africa or in other parts of Europe or in Asia, you know, uh, or, you know, shipping explorations that they were taking place, that they were carrying out. So, uh, you know, so much so that they termed the 15th, 16th centuries as age of explorations, age of discoveries, because they were discovering new, new lands. Now this, now, so... What the Portuguese were basically trying to do, and not only the Portuguese, uh, the other countries in Europe also, but uh, definitely it was the Portuguese that who were successful. So what they were basically trying to do was they were basically trying to find a uh, direct sea link that circumnavigated the African continent and would eventually bring them to India. Right. So, you know, bypassing their needs of going to through the Arabs. So instead of going through the Arabs, they were trying to find a sea route that would lead them to India directly. Now, one direct fallout of this was that instead of reaching India, Columbus ended up reaching South America. Right. So when we say Columbus discovered America, we don't really mean the United States, but primarily uh, America. United States, actually, the North American continent comes much later. It's the South of, South American con continent that got discovered, so-called, quote-unquote, discovered first. Nonetheless, so uh, in their attempts, in their various attempts that they were making, uh, what eventually happens is that before they end up reaching India, they end up, you know, uh, reaching South America. Now, so far, so good, right? So the Portuguese, the Spanish, they have ended up in South America. The Portuguese primarily had their sphere, sphere of influence in Brazil, whereas the other parts of South America were, you know, kind of under the Spanish. Now, as I said, the Portuguese were not the only ones who were trying to find a direct sea route to India, because the problems that the Portuguese were facing, that they did not really want to go through the Arab merchants, was a common problem that other European traders were also facing, other European kingdoms were also facing, whether it was England, whether it was Denmark, whether it was you know France, whether it was Spain, all of them wanted to bypass the Arab merchants. And, you know, they, they were trying and particularly for spices for because for the north european countries the spices that they got from india and southeast asia were uh, very important because the months were much colder they needed to preserve food so as to sustain themselves so it was very imperative for them that they end up you know finding a direct sea route to india and southeast asia now the other explorations from other european countries you know they in a way fail they in a way fail to carry out this long circumnavigated trade route and end up in india but uh, unlike the others the portuguese are able to travel all the way from europe and you know land in india now according to some historians according to some food historians this became possible because of the portuguese chorizos right how the distance is quite long and the sailors for the most part when they were sailing did not really know what lay in these parts of africa right because for the europeans these coasts whether the western coast of africa or the eastern coast of africa was unknown for a long time the europeans were very familiar with the northern part of africa because they were just opposite Europe across the Mediterranean Sea. But the Europeans were not very familiar with the western coast of Africa and the eastern coast of Africa. What they definitely knew was that if they remain close to the coast, if they sail close, close to the coast, eventually they will be able to circumnavigate the Horn of Africa or the tip of Africa and eventually take another northern course and end up in India. That much they knew. But they did not know what the distance was. They did not know what kind of dangers lay in the uh, in, in in the journey. What kind of food they will get in the journey? What kind of you know uh, uh, what kind of people? What kind of civilization? What kind of tribes they will uh, you know face in the journey? 
So what became very important for the sailors was that they needed to carry their own rations. They needed to carry their own food. And for the most part, most of the sailors in, uh, in, in all the ships that belonged to different countries in Europe that were, find, that, that were trying to find a direct sea route to India, they were carrying their own provisions. But what happens is, unlike the northern, the northern part of the northern hemisphere, where Europe is primarily located, where you know the weather is colder, where, where food remains preserved for a longer duration, you know, south of the equator, if we talk about the equator here, the moment they were crossing the south, they were crossing towards the south of the equator, and in, in these regions also, and also in the equatorial region, what they were facing was hot and humid climate most of the time. Hot, humid, hot, dry, basically hot, right? And what this was doing for their rations was the rations that they used to have in their ships were, you know, getting spoiled way faster than, say, when they were when, when they were located in Europe itself. So compared to the colder climate of Europe, when they were in the tropical regions of, of the earth, when they were in the equatorial region of the earth, the food that they had in their ships, they were getting spoiled. And for most of these reasons, uh, for these reasons, most of the ships had to eventually, some of the ships, you know, they would just either later on end up going to South America or, you know, just return to where they came from because their rations were going to run out uh, because they really did not know how far, you know, they had to move. So many of the ships went back and some of the ships went to South America and some of the other country ships like from Germany or from or from uh, say England or from uh, you know Dan uh, or Netherlands or even Denmark, they eventually would go towards North America. But crossing the equator and circumnavigating the African continent to find a direct trade route to India was turning out to be very difficult for for most of the countries. But this race was eventually won by the Portuguese because. It so happens that they used to have the chorizos. And how did the chorizos help in that? So if you remember, I was, I was telling you how the Portuguese mix wine and garlic with their meat, meat to make the sausages. So just like in today's context, either gorom tel use hoy, nohle vinegar use hoy. So vinegar is nothing but a form of wine itself. So wine that has been allowed to ferment longer and also allowed to oxidize so that it eventually turns into something that we call as vinegar, acetic acid. So the wine that the Portuguese were using to make the sausages acted as vinegar. The garlic, the combo of the wine and the garlic acted as preservatives for the meat. And it so happened that whereas the other European ships were finding it difficult to carry out this long journey for the Portuguese, it eventually became possible. Why? Because they were not really running out of supply. The chorizos that they had on their ships allowed them to sustain themselves for this long journey, circumnavigating the African continent. And eventually, and it so happens is that why did the Portuguese, so if, if we look at the map itself, so this is the western coast of India, right? So, and Goa is somewhere here. So, and why, why did it so happen that the Portuguese established their base in Goa, whereas they could have started anywhere here, right? So again, the, the oral history that goes around this topic is that the Malabar coast, that is the Kerala coast of the western Indian coast, was really uh, inhabited by uh, Muslim merchants, Muslim communities, who were not really, you know, uh, you know, pro eating pork, and as such, for the Portuguese, on the other hand, and for the various missions that the the Christian missionaries that accompanied the Portuguese, as well as the Portuguese missions that came, which had a mandate of, you know, not only expanding trade but also expanding Christianity. For them, it was very important that you know consumption of pork was 
you know carried out because that was seen as a that was seen as a uh, as a as a way of you know upholding the faith because uh, even even say in the european context even uh, you know the jews were not you know consumers of pork per se so instead of you know landing in the malabar coast in the kerala coast and setting up base there they chose not to set up their base there because the local communities there were not you know pro or not you know favorable towards eating pork and hence they end up further up north and they end up in goa right where where the konkani community who resided there was open to the idea of eating pork right and so and, and and as they say the rest is history the portuguese come they set up their shop and then we have almost 500 years of portuguese colonial rule taking place in goa damandiu right and that went hand in hand with the other form of colonialism that we talk about when we talk about the british colonialism so you know a very simple artifact as a chorizo you know goes on to have two kinds of impact one allow the portuguese to circumnavigate and at the same time become so important in the local cuisine in the local custom in the local heritage that you know for the goans this is a life that is if it's not there is unimaginable for them you know sausages form a very basic part of their diet like like say for example we talk about fish in the context of assam or we talk in the context of bengal right so some people would say you know rajma chawal in the context of delhi or in the context of north india so you know sausages become that important and that too right something which they were not accustomed to before and something which is a, is of a very recent uh, you know development if we talk in historical terms 500 years is uh, unfortunately very recent right so you know this 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 is you know the interesting story of chorizos and how you know the goan pork sources is developed the kind of history that it had and you know the background that it has now from here i'd like to take you to a slightly different direction right we are we are going to look at another you know food that again has changed history in a big way right i'm sure uh, you can recognize this photo has has the, uh, is the photo uh, did the photo get uploaded is it visible yes yes it is i'm sure most of you have already been able to make out what this is right and even if you have not been able to make out what this is the next photo is going to make it very clear that what exactly this is this is nothing else but potatoes right so these are the these are the potatoes that we are familiar with the kind of potatoes that we have been born with the kind of potatoes that we eat the kind of potatoes that we will eventually die with right so like for most of us we know that potatoes like you know but you know potatoes have become culturally very ingrained in our heritage right so when when we uh, talk about our cuisine, you know, alu pitika bhat is something of an emotion rather than a cuisine, rather than a food, right? So when, when we say alu pitika bhat, we can actually imagine, we can actually feel simplicity itself, right? So we, we, we kind of, you know, remove all the additions, all the spices, all the flavors from our food, and we kind of go into the basic, most basic of the, most basic of the human tastes that our tongue can give us right so that kind of an emotion is evoked when we talk about you know alu pitika when we talk about potatoes right and this these are these and you know some other potatoes like rasets and all that these are some of the most common uh potatoes that you will find worldwide in in today's world right right from a very uh you know far off rural assam village to the most uh, well stocked and costly us supermarket these are the kind of potatoes that you will usually see right so these are the kind of potatoes that are globally consumed in almost all the countries right but to think that you know this is basically an evolution from this so uh, these are like the various different kinds of original varieties of potatoes that were 
you know, uh, actually available in South America and even today are available in South America to a large extent, uh, particularly in the country of Peru. Right. So Peru, the country Peru has more than 400, you know, different varieties of potatoes uh, in its, you know, in its uh, agricultural heritage. And uh, if you if you remember the map that we were talking about, you know, how they were trying to find their route to India, but they end up here. Now, in the context of potatoes, more than the Portuguese, their neighbors, the Spanish, right? So the Portuguese are here, this small, sorry, I have a bad habit of scribbling too much. Okay, so if you look at the map, if I draw this line, this left part is Portugal, the right part is Spain, right? And as I said, in like few minutes prior to this, Portugal had a very big influence in the geographical area that we today know as Brazil. And in the other areas, these areas, what we primarily find is that the Spanish had a far larger influence. So the, it's, 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 the, it were the Spanish traders. It was uh, the Spanish traders who, you know, collected potatoes, uh, from South America, Peru, and also other 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 countries, and took it all the way back to Europe, right? But interestingly, the people in Europe, for the people in Europe in the 15th, 16th century, their diet primarily consisted of uh, bread, wheat, basically, and meat different kinds of meat smoked fried sausages you know uh, or or barbecue or you know um, uh, even uh, fermented to some extent so for the european population initially potato was something that they really evolved right similar is the case with the tomato also they did not really like the potato and the tomato that the spanish had taken back to europe which they were trying to you know, market in Europe. And it's through the Europeans that we again have potatoes in India. Right? Now, it's interesting. One of the first places in India that ends up with potato is Western India. The ports, basically. And even when we talk about the ports, it was primarily the port of Mumbai that you know, experienced the incoming of the potato. The Portuguese used to call potato as batata, not potato, but batata. And even today in Mumbai, a very common street food that you usually get is a batata vara. Batata vara is nothing. Batata means potato. Vara is bor. So basically, alur salt. Right? So batata vara. And the other very common food that goes along with batata vara is the vara pao. And what is vara pao? Vara, again, the potato vara. And pao is the Portuguese bread, the bun, basically. Right. So in Europe, it, it was the Spanish who took it back to Europe. And of course, uh, to some extent, also the Portuguese. But in the Indian context, again, it's the Portuguese that first bring it all the way over to the Indian subcontinent. Right. Now, it's not that it's only India where the potato had a very big influence, right? So if we talk about Europe and primarily from the 18th century onwards, right? So, so if we talk about a post-feudal, uh, post-Black Death Europe from the 14th century till, say, around the 18th century, it was a very prosperous Europe. Uh, Europe was prospering in various fronts. It had a cultural renaissance, it had a trade renaissance, it had a reawakening of the economy, a lot of trade was taking place, a lot of money was being made. And also because the Portuguese and the Spanish were taking, taking back, you know, 
caskets and caskets of gold from South America back to Europe because the original empires that existed in South America were very rich and the Portuguese and the Spanish were able to loot this gold and, gold and silver, right? So with that gold and silver and with, with, with the kind of, you know, uh, and with the kind of monopoly that they ended up establishing in trade because they were able to find this direct sea route and, you know, they could eventually bypass this Arab merchants, what happened was Europe was flourishing for a long time. But of course, from the 18th century, again, when we look at Europe, uh, what we see is that uh, there were a lot of problems that were coming up, right? And one of the biggest problem that was coming up in Europe in the 18th century was hunger. And, and this hunger was also being caused by famine to a large extent. So uh, agricultural fields were lying fallow. Uh, Peasants were not being able to cultivate agricultural fields. Even if they were cultivating, their crops were failing. Uh, they were not being able to grow wheat. Uh, their their agriculture was, uh, you know, not producing enough food for the population, and so on and so forth. And this led to a lot of social, economic, and political changes in Europe. Right? We we all know about the kind of uh, the kind of uh, changes come about in the context of, say, the French Revolution. Right. It's only in this period, in the 18th century, that, you know, the potato comes to Europe by the 15th century itself. But for almost 200 years, right, uh, 15th and uh, 16th century, right, but for almost 200 years, 150 to 200 years, the potato does not become very important. The potato is not accepted by the uh, European population. But it's only in the 18th century when their traditional crops are failing, when when farmers need something to eat that sustain themselves, that, that sustains them for a longer duration, it's then that the potato comes as the superhero. You know, the Aam Admi becomes the hero in this scenario. You know, something that was being despised, something that was not being accepted, something that was not being welcomed, suddenly turns into uh, a source of valuable uh, carbohydrates, a source for valuable vitamins, a source for uh, valuable nutrients, right? And potato farming, uh, uh, farming becomes, you know, widespread in Europe at that point of time. So much so that many dishes in Europe change eventually, right? So if we talk about, say, uh, those of you who have the idea or those of you who drink, you know that you know, in Russia, we usually talk about vodka and we talk about how vodka is prepared from potato. But actually, prior to the 18th century, vodka was originally made from wheat. It's only from the 18th century that you see vodka being made from potato. But then again, later on, when their agriculture sustains itself, they, they don't really make vodka from potato, but they make it from wheat. In the context of Europe also, if you, if you look at the cuisine, the kind of cuisine changes that occurs from the 18th century onwards, we see that in European cuisine, uh, potatoes become, you know, more and more uh, ubiquitous. They are used more and more in their cuisine. They are used more in 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 what they are eating, right? And if a very uh, you know delicious byproduct of that is the French fries that we have today. Ironically, which was not invented in France but in Belgium, right? So these are basically Belgian fries, not really French fries, and if we talk about that in the Indian context, the changes taking place here, and we talk about the potato that goes from South America to Europe, and then we talk about how the potato comes to India, right? We see a huge change coming in the diet of the Indian people also, right? Uh, with the setting up of the Delhi Sultanate in the 13th century, and also with the coming up of the Mughal Empire in the uh, 16th century, it's not that the Mughals were an empire from the beginning itself, but later on, yeah, they, they turned themselves into an empire. Nonetheless, with the coming up of these political structures, what happens is that the diet of Indians had changed to a large extent. The kind of cereals, the kind of grains that they were eating beforehand, they're not eating anymore. They were eating more refined diet. They were eating more, you know, finer grains. To add to that, in the 16th century, what you have is the coming of the potato. And it's not that the potato came alone. There were other, other vegetables that came about in the time period itself. And together, in the last 500 years, these have changed the diet of the Indian people so much that just like the Goans can't really imagine a cuisine that do not have the Goan pork sausages, but which was not there 500 years back, it's very difficult to imagine Indian cuisine today without the potato. And it's very ironical that, you know, uh, 
500 years back or rather from the 18th century itself from where it starts getting used more uh, 300 years back the potato was not so widespread the way we know potato today that's, that's one vegetable that you will find throughout india whether uh, you may not find the different tubers that you find in assam outside you may not find kosu when you go to delhi but you will definitely find potato when you are in delhi you will definitely find potato when you are in kashmir you will definitely find a potato when you are in kerala and this because you know the portuguese were able to find a direct sea route to india because they had the chorizo to help them out right so another uh, episode of how food uh, eventually shapes history in a big way that you know that goes on to have such a big impact that trade routes uh, even 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 uh, cultures change because of that right biryani lovers would know how in the kolkata biryani is really you know famed because of its potato and the egg that it has right so you know it it goes that way from here uh, let's take a leap back now as i was saying food in a way influenced how uh, human beings as species themselves evolve right so uh, homo erectus is one such link in our human evolution um, they are supposed to have uh, roamed in different places of earth somewhere from 2 million years ago to around 2 lakh years ago and a 20 lakh bosor agor agor pora 2 lakh bosor agor 2 million years ago to 2 lakh years ago they are supposed to have existed right so they are kind of a descendant from a previous human species uh semi human or let's say homo species called the homo habilis right and uh, a direct descendant of the homo erectus is the homo sapien right and then we have the homo sapien sapien the modern day humans so why homo erectus is so important right first the, as the name itself suggests these are the first ancestors that we had who could stand erect right and uh, the closest in terms of posture closest in terms of uh, physical appearance right hence the name homo erectus the other more important uh, change that comes about and this is a, this is again to do how this again influences why they them why they are able to you know stand erect why they can function properly as a biped as a bipedal uh, you know animal is because of how they end up using fire either knowingly or unknowingly either willingly or unwillingly in the beginning but at least willingly and knowingly towards the end how they used fire and fire how not not really like you know just build fires for fun thanda lagi se hathe ki bane fire but fire so that they can eat food right and these these actually bring about a lot of difference now one can argue that this is because of fire but the impact of this use of fire has been on food and that actually went on to influence the other part which is that prior to this if we talk about the species which were prior to homo erectus what we really see is that uh, they had smaller brains and larger chest areas and they also had larger stomachs right they had the intestines that they had in their stomach the large intestine and the small intestine they were much larger than what we have today the what modern humans have today the chest size was also much larger than what modern day humans have today whereas the brain size that they had the skull size that they had was much smaller than what we modern humans have so that way if we talk about evolutionarily uh, modern humans in a way have smaller bodies than their ancestors but they have larger brains their brain size are larger their skull size are larger uh, sorry not the skull size the brain size is larger than their predecessors the body becomes smaller but the brain becomes larger and there's a very uh, you know interesting hypothesis that that posits that this happened because of the kind of food they were eating prior to this what they were doing was they were they were eating raw uncooked food whether whether vegetables whether fruits uh, and mostly 
the biggest part of the diet meat meat of different kinds of animals and birds what they were eating was primarily uncooked raw but once homo erectus or you know whoever they were were able to find out uh, people believe that the initial experience must have been accidental that there could have been forest fires because of either uh, dry weather or because there was you know lightning and because there are many evidences of you know lightnings during storms causing wildfires in forests and uh, you know people think that the first experience with cooked food cooked food in the sense that you know cooked in fire food must have been because of such kind of fires that animals must have died in such fires and uh, you know our early ancestors they stumbled upon such bodies that were burnt in fire and uh, maybe they stumbled upon some bodies that were not fully burnt and when they ate it they realized that you know the food was much easily tearable much easily chewable and also generally tasted better than you know that's a very subjective thing to say that food will taste better when cooked than eaten raw but nonetheless one can you know take this flight of fancy that most probably they thought that the food tasted better when it was burnt in fire because I guess that was why they would eventually make the shift to fire. So then when they shifted to, you know, eating food that was cooked, burnt in fire, you know, roasted in fire, over, over you know, hundreds and thousands and lakhs of years, the impact that it had was on the jaw. So when they were eating uncooked food, the skull size of the early humans was much larger, almost comparable to say uh, how, how we look at the skulls of gorillas today. They have a much larger skull size than, than us humans. So when they were eating uncooked food, they needed you know, more jaw power. They needed more power in their jaws to chew that uncooked food. And as such, a large part of their head was you know, uh, was occupied by their jaws, the part of the jaws, occupied the larger part of the head. But once fire was used, once, you know, they started eating cooked food, what happened was the need for stronger jaws over, over thousands and lakhs of years, it got reduced, you know, because food was becoming softer. You know, I dare you, right? Don't, please don't try, okay? You may fall sick. So, uh, but that's the point. So uh, the need for, uh, you know, uh, a stronger jaw, a larger jaw got reduced. This is also the reason why we have much smaller uh, canine teeth, right? Uh, not prostitute for upper, but others. So, you know, because we needed less power to tear off our meat. We needed less power to, you know, break food because food was getting cooked. What it eventually ended up doing in terms of biology and evolution was that uh, because the jaw size became smaller, the part of the head which housed the brain could expand. And because it could expand, the brain could also expand. And because the brain could expand, it eventually gave rise to what we know as Homo sapiens, right? Our direct ancestors. And from there, we have the Homo sapiens sapiens. A very small event, fire and cooked food, and what it eventually ends up with after two million years is us, right? Without TikTok and YouTube and Facebook and whatnot. But that's the idea. Like it's the brain that did all that. Because the brain could expand, because the brain size could become larger. Till date, scientifically speaking, if we talk in terms of size ratio, human beings have one of the largest brain size compared to the body. If you take out a ratio of the brain size to the body size, human beings have the one of the largest brain size in the entire animal kingdom. Some of the species that are much larger than us, you know, bearing species like say elephants, uh, some of the species which are much larger than us have much smaller brain sizes, like smaller than even our brains. But it's this shift in eating food that was roasted, burnt, cooked in fire that made that possible over, you know, a couple of millions of years.
right? And eventually we end up with homo sapiens, right? And those homo sapiens eventually are able to make sausages in the form of chorizos, and they are eventually able to find a direct sea route to India, where the Goans end up eating the sausages and the rest of the Indians also end up eating the potatoes. I'll finally conclude with this last one example that is very uh, you know interesting for me. You know, tea or chai. Now we talk about sah, right? How uh, we, I, I, I myself am not a very avid tree drinker. I, I sometimes like drinking red tea, lalsa, that too without sugar. And I'm surrounded by people who really enjoy drinking milk tea with sugar, right? And for them, I'm an anomaly. Like, how can I not drink tea? But you know. What is interesting is that whether you call it tea or whether you call it chai, it's actually uh, the same, right? And this difference actually comes because of how this particular item was traded and who traded it and how it was traded, right? So I'll go to the next image, right? So this is the tea versus chai kind of a map that you can see. So these blue areas are the areas where T is usually pronounced as chai, cha, sa, but different, different, different forms of that term itself, right? And the red areas are those areas where the beverage, where the drink is pronounced as tea or te or something like that, right? Some variation of the word tea. So the blue areas are where you have, you know, different pronunciations, but similar to chai. And red areas are those areas where you have different pronunciations, but similar to T. Now, this map itself is actually explanatory how this meme comes about, right? But, uh, you know, I'll explain it further. The term chai or cha, the root for that term is actually in Mandarin Chinese, right? And the term tea for the same drink is usually found in the Fujian or Taiwanese form of Chinese that is used, right? And this actually then goes on to influence how the term itself is pronounced. So if you look at these parts, these blue areas, these are the areas where this beverage, the raw material for this beverage, basically, you know, tea leaves. The blue areas are those areas where the tea leaves were primarily traded through land routes. And because the land routes were connected with the main part of China, which primarily spoke Mandarin, we have the term cha or chai in those areas. The red areas are actually areas from where, you know, the link is this. You know, this is basically the tea link. The Dutch were primarily, you know, dealing with tea. Same, same item, same beverage, same tea leaves, but they were dealing with the Taiwanese, they were dealing with the Fujians, and hence when they were trading it, they were trading it as tea, and they were doing it via sea route, right? So they were doing it via sea route, and hence those areas where it was the Dutch that first brought the tea leaves for them, it ended up being tea. England was introduced to tea by the Dutch, by the people of Netherlands. And hence the English people call tea as tea. But what is interesting is, you know, initially tea was supplied to uh, England by the Dutch and hence they call it tea. But later on, what they did was they were able to procure their tea at least prior to, you know, say, uh, you know, extensive cultivation in India itself. They could get their tea from Sri Lanka. Now, interestingly, in Sri Lanka, tea was called cha itself, right? It was called chai itself, right? But even when they, the English were getting tea from Sri Lanka, they did not really change the term from tea to chai. They kept it as tea. So much so that later on in Sri Lanka also, tea became more common, more common in terms of uh, the term being used. Now, if you look at it, as I said,
It's okay. I'll, I'll just. If you look at it, what you can see is that the blue areas where you know the tea traveled through land routes, they were you know called chai. But interestingly, if you look at South America, you will see even Bra Brazil is in blue, right? So in Brazil, the tea must have gone through land routes. And if you look at North America and South America, you see that you know for all other areas, it's red, which means that they call tea as tea and they don't really call it chai. But uh, Brazil, on the other hand, is very unique in that way that they call it cha or chai. Now, this again, primarily because the Portuguese were taking it to Brazil and the Portuguese used to call it cha or chai, right? Because the Portuguese tasted it in India, right? So unlike the Dutch who took it to the rest of Europe, Portuguese experienced tea through India and it's the Portuguese that they, that take tea to Brazil. And hence you have the term chai in these blue areas, including Brazil. Right. So same, same item, same raw material, same tea leaves, but depending on what route was being taken and who were the traders, you eventually have a modern day period today where half the world calls it chai or cha or sa and the other half calls it tea, right? depending on what was being done 400, 500 years ago. And this, why I have included this as something that changed the world is because of how big of an impact tea had in the history of colonialism itself. The kind of, you know, uh, expansionist uh, colonial practices and colonial developments that took place in India and in China are in a big way influenced by tea, right? And even if not for the entirety of India, at least for our own region, at least in the context of uh, in the context of Assam, tea has invariably changed our cultural landscape. You know, something that was not cultivated even 150 years ago is now a backbone of our economy, is such a big part of our economy, is such a big part of our culture, is such a big part of our entire, you know, cultural landscape that we can't really imagine life without tea. We can't really imagine life without sah. And this in the last 150 years itself, right? And one very unlikely connection actually that this, now there were some direct, you know, direct uh, impact of that. Of course, Sa Bagan Kinia Hill, there were tea plantations that came up that had a, that had a big impact on the economy, yes that also had a big impact on the demography, how the demography of Assam changed because, you know, uh, the locals did not really want to work in the tea plantations that, that was coming up under the British. And so the British brought in a lot of Adivasis from Central India and relocated them in the Brahmaputra Valley in Assam, right? And we know the kind of uh, cultural and political, uh, you know, politics that is moving around that seem uh, demographic change even today, right? So, of course, economically and politically and in terms of demography, tea had a big influence in, in, in the context of Assam. But what we largely also don't know is that tea itself had a very big impact in the flood situation as well. We always talk about floods in Assam. We always talk about how uh, it was a drought kind of a situation, uh, although the government did not say that it was a drought, but it was actually a drought kind of a situation in most places in Assam. But other than that, uh, but even even today, when it was large, even this year, when it was largely a drought kind of a situation, places like Dhamaji and others were inundated, right? They were they were badly ravaged by floods. Nonetheless, uh, when we talk about floods, we always talk about you know the siltation that takes place in the Brahmaputra or the other tributaries, how the you know uh, river basins have risen up how there is a lot of sedimentation and hence the rivers, uh, rivers are not able to carry a lot more water than they earlier used to and hence a lot of flood is happening. We talk about deforestation, we talk about cutting of hills, right? We also talk about, say, the earthquake of 1897, we talk about the earthquake of 1950 that, you know, changed the 
courses of rivers like Brahmaputra and which are now, you know, uh, showing an impact in the kind of soil erosion, in the kind of, uh, you know, flood situations that arise. But what we really miss is that the way tea also had a huge impact on the floods that we face today and how. So the first tea plantations that came up were in uh, Dibrugar, uh, which also happens to be my maternal hometown. So uh, the tea plantations that came up, and, and anyone from Dibrugar or people from Dibrugar usually know that, you know, the river Brahmaputra inundates Dibrugar every year. Red alert is sounded in Dibrugar because, you know, the river is flowing above the danger mark. Traditionally, Brahm uh, Dibrugar has been, uh, Dibrugar, Dhimaji, uh, these areas have been, you know, very uh, fertile areas, areas that were regularly inundated by the Brahmaputra, the flood, the, and hence the term floodplains. Agricultural fields were regularly uh, watered by the Brahmaputra. In monsoon season, the water levels would rise, you know, fertile alluvial soil would be deposited in the fields, and then, you know, when water recedes, uh, peasants would take to cultivation. Now, what changes with this setting up of the tea plantations is that tea plants do not really work that way. Tea plants are not something that are very, uh, you know, favorable towards flooding, towards uh, waters. And I'll just want to wind up in five minutes with this. Um, uh, so tea plants are not something that, uh, you know, uh, grow properly in moist soil or flooded soil. So what the British had to do was they had to build build embankments, Mothauri. They had to build embankments to safeguard the first plantations that came up in Dibrugar, right? And it was the building of these embankments, these dams, which eventually had a domino effect, right? So the moment embankments and or Mothauris were built in Dibrugar, what eventually happened was the water that would have, you know, spread towards the areas of Dibrugar are now spreading somewhere else. Now to stop the spread of this extra water somewhere else, embankments were built in other areas, right? And so on and so forth. So today we can't really imagine a river in Assam without a Mothauri. Almost every river has a Mothauri. And building the embankment of Brahmaputra is a big, big, you know, socio-political issue. Every year there is some part where the embankment breaks and the area goes under floods and every year there is a huge hue and cry about building these embankments but the source of these embankments can be found in these tea gardens right the the, the requirements of these tea gardens so another corollary of that is that you know we always hear this term baudhan you know uh, i don't know how many of us have been able to taste and eat baudhan at one point of time baudhan was something which was a very common uh, common rice species that was cultivated. One of the very uh, unique characteristics that Baudhan has is that the top part of the plant, which has the rice seeds, which has the rice basically, which has the grain, is always above water. So no matter how much the water level increases, the Baudhan, the head of the Baudhan, where the rice is, will always be above the water level. So if the water in the fields is up to three feet, the top part of the Baudhan would be above the three feet. If it's five feet, it will be above that five feet. If it's one feet, it's if it's one foot, it will be above that one foot. So we had a crop that was, you know, that that had an organic link to the geographical area that we reside in, that had a very unique way of tackling the frequent uh, inundation of the fields that would have taken place. Right. But when we talk about the 1970s and when we talk about the green revolution that was taking place and that was taking place through the efforts, remarkable efforts of scientists under government of India in different agricultural institutes, in different universities. And we talk about the green revolution and how in, during the green revolution, one of the focus was to create, you know, flood resistant, drought resistant, pest resistant rice. Somehow this whole identity of the Baudhan which had an inbuilt flood resistant capacity did not get noticed, right? And today in, 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 in the 21st century, there are hardly any, uh, you know, peasants who really cultivate Baudhan, right? You do not really get Baudhan in the markets to buy for consumption. And to think that this was all because, you know, the natural setting of the Baudhan went away 
and you had other rice species coming in that replaced the paudhan in many areas and now we consume different kinds of rice which were earlier not there right and this because of the tea that the cultivation of the tea that was begun in the Brahmaputra Valley by the British for which embankments were built, right? So we have the floods and what not because of that. So Budhulir Sahakapur Lagot Ami Hoitu Etur Bhavivola Ivo Zahe Sahakapur Amar Diman Ban Pan Yuhu Mayas. A bit morbid, but maybe we can think about that in those terms also, right? Lastly, if we talk about the Jalebi, I said the Jalebi had, or let's say, you know, for me, a Jilapi had two significance. The first significance was it's the Puja season, and hence I put uh, Jilapi as the cover picture for the PowerPoint presentation. The second connection is that this, again, is an item which is traditionally, if we look at it historically, was something that came from outside. To the Indian subcontinent. The first references to something like uh, the, the pronunciation is Jalebia or Jalebi or Jilabi. You know, these references we usually find it in uh, Tunisia or in some places of uh, Turkey, right? So, Tunisia is the, uh, if we can go back, so Tunisia is the northernmost part of Africa, and here you have Turkey, right? So, in Tunisia and in Turkey, we find the first references to Jalebi in the 9th and 10th century itself, where cookbooks mention the recipe for this. From, from, from there, it moves to Europe, it moves to the Ottoman Empire, it moves to Persia, and by the 15th, 16th century, it has entered the Indian subcontinent. And now, again, the, this Jalebi or Jalebi itself has come with the Arab merchants. They were the ones who brought this recipe with them, right? Just like many of the things that they had taken from the Indian subcontinent to the Euro, the recipe of Jilapi is one which they brought from, you know, uh, Northern Africa and Eastern Europe to India. And, and these have become so culturally ingrained that today we cannot think of a winter without Jilapi. We usually think of, when we usually think of Jilapi, we usually think of the puja season. We think about the melas, we think of the festive season, right? It has become a very ubiquitous sweet that way. So unlike the rasogulla or, you know, chenna poda or the laru pithas, etc., etc., which kind of have an indigenous origin to its existence, Jilapi is something which is an outside import. A thousand years of history, of course, of the import, but nonetheless, now it has become so culturally ingrained that you know no one can really talk about jilapi being a non-indian sweet right it's a very much indian sweet so in supermarkets of europe now you or in supermarkets of america you usually find packaged jilapis like you know as an indian sweet right so where <laughs> there in the therein lies the irony right so the idea the idea of why i talked about you know food in the shaping of history today is to show that, uh, you know, despite what we think, despite what we believe, uh, food has had a much complex uh, exchange between different communities, different geographical locations across time periods, right? And uh, no matter how one would like to imagine that this is our food, this is their food, this is, you know, what our ancestors used to eat, or this is what our, you know, uh, uh, Purva Puruk used to re eat, and this is what our tradition is, the reality is that these traditions were much more fluid. These practices, the whole idea of food is something which is going around, you know, which is constantly evolving, right? And this has also been because of the kind of acceptance that people have shown to different kinds of food at different times. And also the non-acceptance, let's say the farmers of Europe who did not really accept potato at first, but only it's towards the 18th century when they did not really have any other option, that's when they pick up the potato. Right. So similarly, in the Indian context also, there are many such uh, examples where we do not really see an easy act acceptance or early acceptance of many items. But later on, they become very ubiquitous. They become widespread throughout the Indian subcontinent. So that's where I would like to leave today with the thought that uh, much like the colorful plates of food that we usually have, food itself has a much more colorful history. Thank you. 
thank you so much, Kolebda, for this amazing presentation. And uh, I, I think hope all I was our, able to do justice. Of course, you were. And it, it's uh, almost like leaving us all perplexed about how the human evolution itself has happened and how food and something so humble as potato or chai, which we have at regular intervals almost every day in our culinary diet, is had had such uh, great beginnings in history and shaping history thereof. So. Uh, uh, very interesting uh, topic that we had today, and we will now move proceed to the next uh, activity that we, that is the responses from the participants. We expect the participants here to speak up something if they have to, or interact with our resource person right now, uh, requesting everyone if they have any questions can come up with that. Yes, I think Kavita has just commented, Jalebi from South Africa. Yes, definitely. There are many things that we don't really think about that have come from so many different, uh, so many different places, right? We we don't really think about tomatoes or onions yes, 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 that yes. way, not yes, being okay. not being part of our diet. Coconut also these there were off, things. I think. Yes, palm trees basically, palm different trees, kinds yeah. of palm, mm -hmm. yeah, different palm types of palm trees and right, right. you know how different geographies have had you know and also like how different geographies have left their mark on the names itself so you have you have a spice called javitri because it was from the island of java, java right okay. so javitri is a very commonly used uh, spice mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in in indian cuisines and particularly in biryani right mm -hmm. so and it's actually not from india but it's from java and uh, contrary to popular belief like the most of the european traders were not actually looking for spices from india itself but they were looking for spices from southeast asia which were going via india right so yeah. india was in a way a you know uh, extra beneficiary of that spice trade of getting hold of that spices that way yeah we have comments receiving. Uh, uh, any thank questions? You, thank there you, are any? Yes. Yes, Dr. We will now. Uh, if there are no more questions to be asked or anything to be discussed, we should now proceed to the next uh, event or the next activity, which is responses from the family. We have with us Dr. Sharda Ji Chaudhary. She is an assistant for professor in the Department of English in Morikawa College. I request ma'am to speak up a few words. Suman, thank you, Suman. Ma'am, yeah. So, uh, esteemed speaker of the third lecture of Dr. Himanshu Sharma Memorial Lecture Series, Mr. Kuldeep Patwari, Assistant Professor, Department yes, of History, yeah. Guwahati University. Respected uh, Head, Department of History, Mr. Deepak Kalita. Respected colleagues, honorable guests, participants across various disciplines, and PhD. Uh, first of all, I'm really thankful to uh, today's speaker uh, for choosing this topic. Uh, you started with uh, serendipity, and uh, let me add another angle to serendipity by saying that uh, Himanshu uh, loved cooking and uh, he had very fine culinary skills. I must say that. And, uh, you know, he uh, always uh, carried <laughs> out a lot of experimentation in the kitchen, even in the ordinary dal. So, and uh, another angle <laughs> that I would like okay. to, that, that you mentioned, that how food and emotion uh, both are related. So he always told me that right. whenever you make something, always sprinkle it with a lot of emotion, sprinkle it with love. Um, and that is how food uh, right. becomes tastier. Uh, so I'm, I'm really uh, grateful to you for you know uh, bringing out this bringing up this topic for today's uh, lecture, and uh, I also express my sincere gratitude to the college authority and to the Department of History, Morigan College, for planning and organizing this lecture series in fond memory of my husband, Himanshu Sharma. Uh, as uh, I had said in the previous lecture, also that some souls are too good for this world, and uh, so so they leave. Uh, when um, I think of Mangshu as his wife, his colleague, his friend, his confidant, I can say that meeting him, uh, uh, getting to know his ideas, his philosophy, his uh, way of uh, work, his attitude, it is the best thing that could have ever happened to me. Um, and a man is never uh, known by what he says, but a man is known by his deeds, what he does. So, Mangshu is not only an academician and a teacher. In his short span of 43 years, 
he has discharged several responsibilities as an employee, as a teacher, uh, and as a responsible citizen. So uh, he was the coordinator of Krishna Kanta Handicap State Open University, Morigaon College Study Center for a period of 10 years. And uh, he was also the lead secretary of Morigaon College Teachers Unit from 2013-2015. He was the IUMS coordinator, head of the Department of History, and he had played a very, very significant role in drafting the SSR for assessment uh, and accreditation by NA uh, of Morigaon College in the year 2019. Uh, he's the founder of uh, the NGO Ananyo, uh, which has rendered human service to society at large. Um, no matter how much you go on speaking and talking of him, you cannot exhaust his essence. And uh, that is uh, how one journeys beyond mortality. Under his initiative, uh, the uh, NGO worked a lot to help the erosion-stricken people of the district um, by paying examination fees of, uh, of the children of the affected uh, families. Uh, he also worked for promoting tourism uh, in Morigaon. Uh, he has helped the poor students uh, from government schools with educational aid. And uh, he has also empowered, uh, he has taken on this project of empowering women weavers of the district by providing them with raw materials. Uh, for weaving gamusas and uh, also uh, he arranged for selling of the finished product. Um, moreover, uh, the previous year in 2020 when uh, he was suffering from uh, the from the fever that remained undiagnosed throughout, uh, he still he, he never stopped from uh, serving the society. He uh, when, when the COVID was uh, you know, really large, uh, he even went to the hospitals, to the to government hospitals which uh, had run out of uh, the supply of uh, sanitation items. Uh, so, um, and in spite of everything, uh, uh, he always had all the time in the world for his family, for me and our daughter. And we are uh, so blessed to have his blessings with us. Uh, he's, he's no more with us uh, physically, but uh, I still feel his presence everywhere. Uh, wherever I go, wherever we go. And um, that is what I said, that you cannot exhaust his essence. And I, I sincerely hope that uh, this lecture series, uh, which we are organizing, becomes a channel of uh, knowledge dissemination uh, to the wonderful lectures that we have had so far and we shall have in future. And this is how uh, we would love to commemorate Himanshu as a dissemination of knowledge. Uh, once again, I thank everyone who is present here today on uh, this online platform. Thank you one and all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, it's always new every time we know about Himangshu. So it's always something new that we get to know in every subsequent lectures that we are having. Something new every time happens and we get to know something different and uh, new about Himangshu, sir, as always. Uh, with that note, we will now, uh, we ha I have an announcement to make meanwhile. There is a feedback link that has been uh, given in the messages section by Bulbul Das. He's an assistant professor of the computer applications department and he has been coordinating with us with all the uh, technicalities. He has, uh, been, he has sent a feedback link and I request all the participants here to kindly fill up the feedback form so that we can uh, give out the certificates for the present lecture. Uh, proceeding to which now we have the last but not the least uh, activity of the, of the of the of today's lecture. We have uh, the vote of thanks to be delivered by Mr. Deepak Kolita. He is the coordinator of, of HSM lecture series and also the HOD of the Department of History, Morigao College. I request sir to speak up a few words on this. What do you say? Thank you. Thank you, Suman. Am I audible? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you are. Okay. Thank you, Suman, for giving me the opportunity to deliver the vote of thanks. Respected resource person and the members of a Himangshu Sharma Memorial Lecture, uh, family members and uh, all the participants and uh, respected teachers of Morino College and uh, uh, members of uh, 
Himaksu Sharma Memorial Lecture Series. My Homiat Kobo Bisaru, Mane Himaksu Sharma Saro Bikazi, Prodipe Muk Zotesto, Kizikini Kota Kole, Azimo Zotesto Kabu Kurisu, Aku Saro Logot Zotesto in Kampur, the Boat Kota Sare Hikale. He hum more repeat coin of Hakuria, when a Aru Sarorata Hopuna Sile, a lecture is to Arambo for a Mul Karantu, Sare the dia, head of the department or dietolisle, Sare Muk Katakotaku is the book, Ami Uti Hunkale, National Seminar Hon Patim, to me Muk Dokon paper and a dipo like you are. Sare Muk Saramodia questions are Ami to Abnalova Asu, Arumai to. Abnak promise for his Uzema, Abnak Dok on the Parmu Logors, Asse, Aru Mursinaki, Asemaka, Anibo Parimoru, Kito Tower, He Hopuntu, Ega Hopun, where he killed, uh, what had the on Mazar Pan Mahu, Aru Hibabi Ami, a lecture series to Arambo Kurilo, Karu Tao the Tamar Mazar Kake, Karun Academy activity villa called Director of Kamizia, the Hibo Labo, or Hibabe, uh, Mar Tiha Hibagot or Propra, if the Bostad Lagose, Aru Azi. Atar Tritio to lecture Asile. My Protomote, a Holagor Horak Babokuzisu, Amar Humanio Azir, a lecturer's reserve speaker, Bokta Kulip Patori de Bolle. Take a day at a Kovalekole, Kobeta Jotil Homer Mazoda set, Armazotu Ahi Amak Azi, a Onustan to tell Kupundorke. Our major issue for today is that we are not going to talk about that. And our partner is going to be talking about the fact that we are going to be talking about the fact that we are going to be talking about the fact that we are going to be talking Himanku Harma Memorial Lecture Series or Patron Doctor Professor Jogen Sundra Kurita Sarole, Holagar Horag Bohaisi and our office commander Doctor Lilakanda Borta Kurdebolo, Tekete Azi, Onusantu, Amak Kira Porcelana Kurebolagi, He Homo Amak Tekete Amak Tundi Zonae Silar Tikere, Azi Onusantu Deon, Udbudhan Kurita Tarbabet and Nobat Gapon Kurisu. Holagar Horag Bohaisu, Mohabit Dalar, Upadaka Muda, Doctor Hemolata Horma Bidole. Tekete Amak Bibino de Hot Paramor Hag Bohaya Hise. Palagor Horag Bohaisu, Amar Zihokol Potinity, Amar Zihokol Bibino de Horpra, Bibino Homor Logo de Parator, Bibino Pantorpra, Zihokol Lugiate, Postida, Hopula, Mid Honobar, Kito Potter, Horta Holagor Horag Bohaisu. Palagor Horag Bohaisu, Amar Himanku Horma Memorial Lecture Series, or Zihokol Amar. Member as a Hokul member, a Holagor Horag Bohaisu. Technical Behot Hamak Hohaikura Bulbulda, Computer Vigan Bipagor, Aru Geography Bipagor, Jointo Kumarda, Aru Logote, Jazantu Tamuli, Mass Communication Department, John Mejoy Tamuli, E. Kululami Holagor Horag Bohaisu, Amar Tritiro Sutsu Borgor Kormosari Hokuloma Bibino Ketot Hohaikusi, Teket Hokulami Holagor Horag Bohaisu. Aru Hodo Hot Mur Bibhag or Zihokal Lamar Ohojukia said Elmukor of Bihone uh Sumon Raz Nikil. Elmukor of Bihone e Kajukusidami Solania Moi of Politukiti on War or to Homobe no Hai. But again Moti New Gorage or Murt or for Pram of Holagor for Agbohasu. Aruaharakisu Ami Abobisotelo, Abnalakor Homu uh Yate Lugdan for a Homu Amar and Bibinor uh Look at a hisse, Hopolar Hojita Lakurin, Aru Yaki Koimur Holagor Hore, Yate Hamori Marisu, a Kinde Dimudia Sumoneta Kuhona Kuris, the Amar feedback from the Ase, Hopolar feedback from Kilakurgo, Aru Titiami as Mar certificate Divo Prazabo, but again Hopolak feedback from Panama chat box or the same, Hopolakilakurami on Luchalago. Thank you so much, sir, for your kind words. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Kolida, again. Uh, yeah. We have been uh, enlightened again, if I 
if that's a proper word. And it's very interesting that you have uh, whatever you've just spoken about the entire uh, you know journey of food and how it related people and connected people world over. Uh, with that positive note, we will depart from this particular lecture series with again a promise of meeting in the next uh, lecture, uh, the fourth lecture, which will be scheduled, and the uh, dates of it will be mentioned in a very short while in the respective uh, WhatsApp groups that we have for this particular lecture, uh, lecture series. Uh, I request everyone again to kindly fill up their feedback forms, and uh, I, with that note, I would like to end today's uh, lecture series program. Thank you, Sulukulipda, once again for your all your time, despite the busy schedule you have, and despite yeah. all the uh, uncertainties that were there in, uh, with your uh, supervisor's uh, untimely demise. Yeah. We respect that, and uh, it's uh, unfortunate, but then the show must go, go on, as the people see. Uh, again, thank you, everyone, for your kind hearing, for your patient hearing, and uh, we will meet again for the next next lecture. With that note, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.